I'm Sari Kimball, and I've done just about everything in the food industry. I have helped hundreds of packaged food business entrepreneurs, and now I want to help you make your delicious dream a reality. Whether you want to be successful at farmer's markets, online, or wholesale onto store shelves, food business success is your secret ingredient. I will show you how to avoid an expensive hobby and instead run a profitable food business. Now let's jump in. Hey there, welcome back to the podcast. Oh my gosh, what did you guys think about last week's episode on Money Lies with Jill Wright? That was amazing, and it's going to, we're going to continue the conversation about money. We're talking about money all this month, which if it's making you a little bit uncomfortable, then this is definitely where you need to be. Money allows you to have a business. It is literally the definition of a business is that there is an exchange of value for money. And otherwise, if you're not doing that and you're not growing your business um, by creating more value in exchange for money, then, um, then you don't have a business. You have a hobby. And so I know this is uncomfortable. It's honestly even uncomfortable for me to talk about it. Um, I'm like, oh my gosh, I have so much. Um, I do have a lot of fear about judgment of you guys. Like, oh my gosh, they're going to totally judge me for talking about money, even though I'm working on my own money beliefs. And, you know, I don't have this all figured out by any means. Uh, but I think this topic is so, so important. Um, it's probably the number one thing we got to work through as an entrepreneur. And I'm just going to throw in this one time caveat that I get that not everybody is in a place where um, they can feel comfortable talking about money. I understand that, um, you know, we are in a time where some people are really struggling and, and I am very aware of that and sensitive to that. And if you are starting a business or you want to grow your packaged food business, money is just something we cannot avoid and we really need to work on our money things. So I am not talking about money around your basic Maslow hierarchy of needs. This is really about doing that next level work if you are working on your business. So and I also want to say here that money is not about money, in my opinion. Uh, money is not just about the things that I can get and the material possessions I can own and keeping a scorecard for your own validation, right? But to me, money is a way for us to measure our impact, that when you have a certain number of, when you have a certain sales number at the end of the year or the end of the month, that means you have sold X number of products and packages. And if you really believe in your product, then you are delivering value. You are giving value to your customers. And so it is a kind of practical way of keeping score. Uh, but I in no way mean that we should covet money and that money should be everything in our life. And in fact, I would say the opposite. It's more about how can you serve? How can you provide amazing value? And then money comes to you. And as my mentor, Tara Johnson, likes to say, no money, no impact. It's really hard to keep a business going if you are not making money. So when I talk about money tolerance, you're probably like, what? <laughs> of course, I of course I want more money in my life. What do you mean? I'm not intolerant to money. And I'm actually here to say that you maybe are. Most of us are. Um, so let's just back up a little bit and say that money is neutral. It just is. It's an energy. It's it's something that um, we use to live our lives, and it's not good or bad, but we all have stories that we have um, had since childhood uh, that we have watched the way our family of origin um, talked about money, 
And so we've built up these stories um, of what money is and whether it's good or bad. And so I'm just asking you to be open, to be curious, to come with um, that scientific mind, right? To maybe consider rethinking some of your money stories. So in today's episode, I want to give you some concrete things to do to help uh, once you've uncovered your money stories and to be more tolerant and allowing of money. But I want to kind of step back and talk about a few concepts first. Money is neutral. It isn't good. It isn't bad. But then we all have stories about money. We've assigned these lies, these stories, or maybe it's the truth and that's fine about money. And all I'm asking you to do is to come to this episode today being a little curious, being open to rethinking, right? That think like a scientist mentality. And I just want you to be willing to ask yourself, is this true? And if it is true, is it serving you? If you're like, yes, that is a hundred percent true in my belief, just ask if it is actually serving you. And if it is a money lie, then how do we change it? Or if it isn't serving us, how do we adjust that so that we can be more successful? Money just amplifies who you are in the world. There is never enough money if you feel, if you're trying to gain safety and security from money, there is never enough money that will give you that. If you are already a generous person, money will just amplify your generosity. But if you're already a worried person about money, it's just going to amplify your worry about money. I know you would like to think that if you had X amount of dollars, like say it out loud, what is that amount of money? If I had a million dollars, I would not have any worries. I would not feel insecure. I would not feel unsafe. And I'm telling you 100% that is not true. You have new worries at a million dollars. Now you're worried about losing it, right? Or making a bad decision, investing it wrong. It just amplifies who you already are or the beliefs you already have. So unless we do this money work, this uncovering our money lies and resetting our thermostat, our tolerance for money, then this cycle is just going to repeat itself over and over and over again. And you're never going to get any farther in your business. I've been reading the book that Jill recommended, uh, Thou Shalt Prosper. It's a pretty um, heavy book. It's not, it's not a light read um, and, and pretty religious um, as far as Judaism is concerned. But I've really been able to gleam some really important pieces that I wanted to highlight here. And the big one is that a lot of us have been socialized to believe money is bad, right? That money is the root of all evil. I know I was. I grew up in a um, in a Mormon household, actually, and uh, money was definitely seen as right the root of all evil. Like you have to give away your money um, if you make a lot of money, you have to sort of repent for that and make up for it. Like do a lot of acts of service to make up for the fact that you make a lot of money. Um, But what this book even talked about further was how we are actually being socialized and almost almost indoctrinated in the media to really have a a really strong um, feeling, a really strong reaction to business, that business owners are bad, the greedy business owner. And they've done studies about um, pulling out how many times in movies and books and cartoons and all of these places in media or magazines and newspapers where the business is really portrayed as a greedy, bad person or a bad entity. And um, think about 
our, that story that we tell ourselves, right? About like the greedy CEO and the, the stockholders and the board, and they're just trying to get everybody's money. And it's like even saying it out loud, I'm like, yeah, but that is true, right? And I'm like, but is it? Like, I'm a business owner. You're a business owner. If you're thinking about doing this or you're already in your business, are you that way? Of course, there's going to be some greedy business owners, but there's also going to be just as many, if not more, who are in business to serve, who are in business to create abundance, to create jobs. And if you have a full-time job, most likely many of you are working for a business that is providing benefits, that is providing pay. Like what on earth is wrong with that? And yes, yet we do have this kind of compass, um, moral compass that um, you can't get, you can't make too much money. Like be in business, but not too much, right? Don't be too profitable. If you want to create change in this world, the best way you can do that is by creating money, creating jobs. That's how you create jobs. That's how you create wealth. That's how you can support the causes that you believe in. That's how you can further the food industry, how you can make it better is through money, not by suffering and being poor. And yet I really think we get so hung up on this. I mean, even just reading this book really like was an aha of like, wow, yeah, I disparage. There's a lot of kind of business owners that I would disparage. And think about it. It makes no sense, right? We are not aligned to grow our business and be successful if we are also believing that making money is a selfish activity. It's like you have the foot on the brake and then you're also trying to push the car uphill. You're never going to get there. The car is always going to win. It's going to be a slog even if you do get up there and then you'll probably lose it. <laughs> So yeah, I would ask you to really think about how is it that you think about business? Do you celebrate entrepreneurs? Do you think, oh my gosh, I mean, think about all these amazing entrepreneurs who have changed our lives, right? Jeff Bezos or with Amazon or I don't know all these people's names off the top of my head, but I think about Starbucks, how that changed our whole coffee culture and the to-go coffee, right? I mean, totally revolutionized it, like it or hate it right now, but they completely changed the face of business. Airbnb, Uber, all of these businesses that now we have the sharing economy, right? Where um, our cars and our, our home spaces, we're able to rent those out. Or Facebook, oh my gosh, right? That's a really good one. Do we actually celebrate those founders or do we criminalize them? Do we say, well, they should have just done that out of the goodness of their heart? So we really need to check our beliefs about business. Is the act of making money can it be good? How do you feel about charging somebody the amount of money you charge them for your product? Is it okay for you to charge them that? I know a lot of you guys are get really hung up on this. You're like, how could I charge somebody $15 for my granola? Well, it needs to come from a belief that your granola is worth every single penny, that you are delivering amazing value. Do you believe in it? If you don't believe that it is worth that, then there's always going to be a push-pull. And like I said, it's going to be really, really hard. It's going to make your journey really hard to have the break on the entire way up the, up the mountain. I've been thinking a lot about money, obviously, this week um, as I'm preparing for April. And you guys are listening to this in April. And actually this week, um, when you're listening to this, I am going to be, I will be on a beach in Florida, uh, taking my first trip ever <laughs> um, since COVID, getting on an airplane uh, to celebrate uh, a really good friend of mine's 50th birthday. It's really interesting. Actually, it's cool that I'm going to be with him because he is one of the most generous people I know. And he honestly has really got me thinking a lot about generosity. Uh, and we'll talk, I want to talk more about that generosity challenge and check in and see how you're doing. But he's one of those guys like, 
we go out to dinner and he'll be like, hey, look around the room. Whose dinner should we pick up tonight? And it's so fun, right? And I just love that. And he's an entrepreneur and he has just really been, oh, I'm like getting a little emotional. He's such an amazing mentor and friend and we have so much fun together and I'm just really honored to be spending his big birthday with him. So shout out to Mark. Happy birthday, friend. Also in preparation for this week, this month, I had a great conversation with my brother, two years younger than me. And it's so fascinating um, as the older, you know, as we've gotten older to watch him and me, and we're so different in many ways. In in some ways we're very similar, but like when it comes to his work and how he um, sees his leadership role and how he kind of views work and how he, he works with money and perceives money has been very, very different. I'm always like, asking him like just out of curiosity those questions so that I can understand like wow there's like a totally different perspective in the world about money. I would say my money story has been about scarcity that when good things happen then I'm just waiting for the other shoe to drop. I bet some of you guys can can relate to that like oh that was a windfall that was great now, when is it going to get bad again, right? When, when am I gonna like get the letter from the IRS or whatever, right? And he just doesn't have that experience with money. He just believes it's always gonna be there. It always flows. There's always enough. He's like so confident about it. And it just, I like really wanna understand where that came from or how he does that because I'm like, we had the same parents, right? (laughs) And we grew up in the same household, um, got the same messages about money. And yet he has a completely different modus operandus in the world around money. And he was actually telling me, him and uh, my sister-in-law were telling me that they started a practice a a long time ago where they, um, put in when he would get a bonus from work, he would put in um, a percentage of money and they it's just called a generosity account. And it's for things that come up uh, where, you know, they can just write a check and they don't have to think about how is this going to take away from our daily living or anything like that. It's like money that was a bonus anyway. And then they just give it away and have so much fun. Um, I remember when I had a surgery a couple of years ago, uh, I was really worried as an entrepreneur. It's not like I have the most amazing health insurance. And there was a lot of money out of pocket to pay for this dang appendicitis. And money was, I was worried about it. I was like, how am I going to pay for this? You know, and I wasn't making a ton in my business. Um, and it was stressful. And I remember they, um, all right, just got a little teared up. Um, I was like at home recovering and uh, they brought me some food and hung out for a little bit and then left. And then I opened up the bag of Thai food and they had written me a check um, to help me cover my medical expenses. And I was just like so overwhelmed with gratitude for them and was just like, what? <laughs> you know? And they said, yeah, this came from this you know, generosity fund. My point in this tangent is that here are examples, uh, two examples of people who are inspiring me to be more generous. And I have really found that that has opened up the flow of money and abundance into my life as I have been more outward and giving. And I talked about that in the bonus um, generosity episode. And of course, we're going to keep talking about generosity this month. But I know for me, and this is really what we're talking about on this episode, is if your belief is around scarcity and worry and there's never enough and the shoe always is always going to drop and it's going to be worse than it was before, this is that intolerance for money that I'm talking about. We are actually pushing money and abundance and thriving and prosperity away. 
It's with our thoughts, our words, and our actions that we do this. So when you think about if you were in a relationship with money, which <laughs> hint, hint, you actually are in a relationship with money, how would you describe it? If you were going to write a love letter to money, would it actually be a hate letter? Most of us would probably be writing a pretty terrible letter to money. Money, why are you never here when I need it? Even when you do show up, it's never enough. Think about it. If you were in a real relationship with somebody that you were treating the way you treat money and saying the things you say about money, would they stick around? Probably not. I don't think I would. I want you here. I need you here. But then it's never, ever enough. And oh, wait, you're actually evil, the root of all evil, and you're bad. No, I don't want you here. Oh, my gosh. It's just crazy when you think about that, right? I love the book, The Big Leap by Gay Hendricks. I highly recommend it. I've been recommending this book to a number of clients uh, that I'm working with on forecasting for their business, and we're forecasting for growth. I've talked a lot about the capital needs and that stair-step model where every time we scale up, there's going to be upfront capital and it gets more and more, but the flip side is that we're also making more. And you kind of start where you are now, and I, I was joking with one that all we're doing is adding zeros, both to the expenses and to the, you know, the sales number. And we almost have to build comfortability with it. We have to practice being comfortable because both numbers seem unreal. They seem unattainable, but they are attainable if you open up your mindset, your money mindset, but it is an adjustment. This is that practice of increasing our money tolerance and our success tolerance. Uh, most of us are also intolerant of success. We are very skeptical of our success. And I love this book as a practice um, and learning how to reset that. He describes this intolerance as a set point, that it's much like a thermometer in a room. So we have a belief that we are um, in a room and it should be at the temperature of 68. And all of that beliefs are backed up by like all of the stories and all of the conditioning we've had throughout our whole lives. But then we decide we want it to be warmer, right? We, there's the gap, right? The goal. We actually want to be in a room that's 72 degrees. Well, in physics too, it works this way as well, but we will always want to return to that set point, that, that will always come back down to that 68 degrees unless we disrupt the inputs. We have to do something to disrupt the pattern that has been ingrained. They've done all these studies on lottery winners and most lottery winners, they win millions of dollars and especially the ones that come from very low um, income levels, they actually, within, I think it's like five years, they have returned to that same level of income that they were making before they won their lottery. Isn't that crazy? Talk about a money intolerance, right? That like, we will actually sabotage ourselves and create circumstances where we will get back to the place where we were. The same goes for weight loss for many of us. I mean, that same concept applies that if you lose a bunch of weight, you will always return to that same weight that you were unless you do something that interrupts the patterns in your mind, that changes how your brain is wired and how it thinks. So how do we expand that tolerance for money, for success? So I pulled together a few different money hacks, some different um, ways that we can interrupt and change these patterns that I've incorporated in my life over the last few years that have been tremendously helpful for growing my own money tolerance and my own success tolerance. And they're coming from actually a lot of different sources, but I'm just going to go ahead and read off. I think I, there's seven of them. So the first one is creating mantras um, that you are saying over and over again. Those beliefs about money, those lies, those stories we've been telling ourselves, they are well-worn paths in our brain. 
And we need to purposefully and intentionally practice believing new things. So the mantra that uh, is used in the book, The Big Leap, um, I expand in abundant success and love every day. And I actually have that in a sticky note in front of me on my computer as I record this. So put sticky notes around, um, put them on your bathroom mirror, put them by your nightstand. Uh, you're really like, how can you repeat this over and over again and start, you know, creating a different path, a different pattern in your brain? It's so well worn. It's like that ticker tape that's just running in the background, and we need to start interrupting that. If you can, start noticing when those old beliefs come up and then repeating your mantra frequently. Another one that I write every day is, I love money and money loves me. And that goes back to that you know, love letter to money. Um, do you have the capacity to have and give money? and opening up that relationship of love. And it, it feels even weird to say it out loud, like I love money because we have such a negative bias for people who love money. But you know what? I love money and then I get to give money. I get to support people. I get to be really generous. The second one is to celebrate every dang dollar that comes in. I want you to do a physical act when money comes in, whether it's virtually on your bank account or physically in a check or cash. Uh, I want you to kiss it, high five it, do a little dance, like let money know that you love it, that no matter how big or small, you are appreciating it. Think about when we get checks or something, you know, in the mail and it's like, ugh. Really? It was only for $20? Heck no! Celebrate it! Money doesn't want to hang around you if you're like, it was only, you know? <laughs> like, appreciate it, love it, celebrate every dollar, big and small. I want you to um, do a writing exercise. This is number three. Uh, consider this writing exercise. Either write a dear money letter about the new relationship that you want to have. Like I said, describe it like a lover, like a your best friend. Isn't that the relationship that would feel a lot better than the one you currently have with money? Or do a I, I am grateful to money for writing exercise. This one is so powerful. I think I talked about it a, a number of episodes ago, so I'm just going to talk about it again because it's amazing. I actually did this. I was preparing for my generosity challenge that I want to tell you guys about, um, but that morning I went ahead and did this exercise. So if you think about it, I know we talk about money can't buy you happiness, and that is 100% true. That is a thought in your brain that you are happy, that you're creating emotion. However, money is really at just about every single thing we do and experience in this world. So why not recognize it and be grateful for it? Instead of pushing away and saying, oh, money doesn't matter. I don't need money to be happy. Even taking, okay, Taking a walk, that's free, right? But you still need to have clothing that is appropriate to the temperature outside. You still need shoes. If you were <laughs> naked outside <laughs> with no shoes on, you know, maybe I would concede this argument, but it's unlikely that that's happening. And you're going to need money for the ticket you get <laughs> for walking around naked. So why not celebrate and be grateful Think about all the many, many ways that money serves you and is helping you to have a better life, to experience a more full, rich, fun life. The fact that I could go out to brunch yesterday with my brother and sit on a patio with amazing sun, spring sun in Colorado on our faces and eat a delicious meal that help facilitate great conversation, right? Like that is a whole experience that money was a big part of. Not everything, but a part of it for sure. 
So I want to encourage you, honestly, to do this. I, I'm grateful to money for exercise. Write this down. Do this as a morning exercise frequently and really watch yourself like it literally like kind of melts you in a good way. It sets you up to be like, ooh, what else is possible? Like it feels great to be grateful to money. All right. The next thing is to put money around your house to remind you of how rich you are. If you are listening to this podcast, you are most likely in a first world de developed country that has clean drinking water, that has access to technology, that has, you have food to eat, like you have electricity that heats or cools your home. You are by all, by comparison to many, many other countries and people in the world, you are rich. So just think about that for a minute. And, and be okay with that. Because like, if you're in the United States, so many of us are pushing against being rich, that that is a bad thing. But if you compare yourself to somebody in a third world country where the poverty levels are much higher, where there is war, where there is famine, I'm sorry, it doesn't matter how much or little you are making in the United States, you are effing rich. <laughs> So there's no getting around it. So let's actually expand. This is again about expanding that tolerance, raising the thermostat on our success tolerance. I, I can't even remember where I got this idea. I read it in a book. Um, I swear it's like the only thing I remembered from him. Putting money, like if you can do $20 bills or $50 bills or $100 bills, put money around your house. So I have one in front of my computer and I have one, um, a hundred dollar bill in my nightstand. So that every morning when I wake up, I'm like, oh, hello there. I'm so rich. That's amazing. And now I get to go out and create impact in the world because I'm not so worried about if the whole house of cards is going to come falling down on me, right? I can record this podcast because I feel taken care of, because I feel abundance in the world, because I celebrate how much I do have. And I'm so grateful for it. And now I get to contribute to the world. People want to buy from others, from businesses that feel sufficiency, that don't feel that desperation, take, 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 you need to give me money. I mean, think about your own experience of buying. If you felt that way, you're pretty turned off and don't really want to participate. So do yourself a favor and get into your own sufficiency. So just remind yourself how rich you are. And this isn't about like, oh, feel bad about yourself because you're richer than like most, <laughs> much of the world. No, this is where we can make impact. When you realize how rich you are, then you have more to give. A long time ago, I used to listen to Susie Orman. So this is the next one. It's kind of related, but um, take care of your money. Uh, she was like really, I want to say it's like the 90s. I remember her being on Oprah and, and things. And, and when I first, I moved out of the house um, when I was 17. And I really just wanted to be on my own. I wanted to have all my own money and make my own money and, you know, do it all myself. And I, you know, we, doesn't, we don't get taught this stuff about money very well in high school or any of our schooling. And so I was really trying to learn about money and how do you get more of it, right? Because I was I was like a receptionist for a CPA and I was trying to figure out how to make more money. And she talked about um, taking care of your money, showing it respect. Again, that same kind of, you know, star-crossed, jilted lover kind of thing going on where we want it, we want it, we want it. And then when we do get it, we just like crinkle it up and shove it in our wallet or in our pants pockets or whatever. And she talked about how important it is to lovingly care for your money. To She talked about even like facing all of your bills one way and doing it from like, you know, highest to lowest or lowest to highest and then like carefully putting it in your wallet and that you want to even have money in your wallet, right? Because that same concept of like, I'm so rich. 
and I'm so prosperous um, and I'm attracting money. How do you care for money? Do you respect it? Do you love it? So taking care of your money. When I worked for a Whole Foods Market, I remember the customer service team leader telling me one time uh, that if you look for it, there is money all over the place in Whole Foods um, that people were constantly dropping money. And the rule was, um, if you found it, you turned it in and like where you found it and the date. And then I can't remember if it was like a week later, um, if nobody claimed it, then, uh, then it was yours. And I totally remember being like, once I was aware of that, then I was like finding money all over the place. It was crazy. And the next thing, I don't even know what number I'm on, but (laughs) I'm just going to keep going. Uh, Do the things, take the actions that you want other people to do for you. This is where that whole generosity challenge really comes into play. And if you don't know what that is, go and listen to the bonus episode from April 1st. But this is where you can really start shaking loose some of the holding on so tightly to money feelings. So are you willing to go and if you want people to give you money for your products, are you willing to go and spend money on their products? Are you, or are you always trying to save every penny and you're like, no, no, I can't get that local granola because... I don't have the money, but I want other people to do that for me, right? Or whatever it is, the coffee or the jam or the bread. Like, are you willing to, and I don't mean that your entire purchase, your entire grocery purchase for the week is all these specialty local foods, but have you at least supported one local producer and paid a little bit more than what you can get at the cheapest grocery store? at least once this week? Is that a weekly practice for you? If it's not, I want you to think about your beliefs on whether it's okay for you to be charging what you're charging. And if those two things are out of alignment, I am sorry, my friend, but you are working against yourself and the success, the potential success of your business. If you're here listening to this podcast, it's because you want to start a packaged food business or you want to grow your current one, but you got to clean up your money thoughts, those money lies. I went yesterday and I took that $100 bill that I showed you if you were watching the YouTube channel uh, video, and I went to the Winter Farmer's Market in my area, and I took that $100 bill, and I was like, I am going to have so much fun spending this. What can I buy? And I tried to go to producers who I don't always, because I don't eat like, I don't eat gluten. um, So I don't eat a lot of sugar. So I never buy things from them, right? For me. But I was like, this isn't about me. This is about like creating abundance and generosity and having a ton of fun. So I was like, I don't care if I would eat it or not. I'm going to go talk to other producers and hear their stories and have fun being sold to. And so I bought cookies for my nieces and nephews. I bought treats for my market staff. And then honestly, and I didn't buy anything that I normally would buy with this money. So like the eggs and the mushrooms and the lettuce, I bought that with a different, my like household weekly grocery income, right? So I was like, this money is just for having fun. I was honestly actually having trouble spending it all, which sounds crazy. Um... I just like, I live by myself. I didn't, I don't need that much stuff. And like, I had already bought stuff for my, you know, my nieces and nephews and my mom and my, (laughs) and my staff. So I actually did something really fun. I, I just gave certain amounts of money to different vendors. And I said, Hey, um, the next three people that come up and ask for coffee uh, from you, I just want you to tell them it's on, on you, you know, that, So I just like paid ahead for somebody else's coffee. Same with like the bread gal, right? I was like, here's $10. The next person who comes up, just give them that money towards their purchase. And I was like, how fun is that, right? Like, so somebody's going to walk up and then they're going to be like, yeah, I'll take a cup of coffee. And he's going to be like, cool. Somebody already bought it for you. 
I was like, oh, that's even more fun. So I really had so much fun. Um, and I just felt the abundance and the generosity flowing. I was smiling all day. It was so, so, so much fun. You know, generosity, I really tried to do it from a place of like, I'm getting nothing back from this, um, but I got so much from it. I got so much pleasure and joy and watching my niece and nephew eat the cookies and they love them. And just being able to think about the joy that I created in that space, um, both from supporting those local producers and then the people getting some free coffee or free bread or free <laughs> whatever it was. So I hope that you are doing your generosity challenge this, this month. I would love for you to take a picture of it. Take a picture of your haul or um, the money ahead of time or something that you can show us how you did your generosity challenge. I will post the photo of me um, with my $100 bill before I started over on Instagram. Instagram, so you can go check that out. I hope you're doing this. Even if you're skeptical, just, just do it. Take $20, take $50 and go try it and just see how you feel. Let it shake some of those scarcity cobwebs loose. Oh my gosh, this turned into a longer podcast than I expected. But as much as I like am uncomfortable talking about money, I know that this is the way and I know that it is what we need to be talking about. And it's so important. If you're going to start a business, you're going to bring up all of your money drama. So I'm going to close with just a comment about money, that it is a flow, that abundance comes in a lot of different ways if you're open to it, and that it comes back in a lot of different ways. It doesn't, it's not always going to come back in a one-to-one -one ratio, right? but that it comes back and maybe in people's time that they give me uh, in doing service, um, someone does something generous for me or that it comes back in dollars. The last hack I wanna offer you is to banish the words, I don't know. The quickest way to shut the door on creativity and looking at all possible solutions um, finding new ways to bring in money, to create money, to reduce expenses is by using the words, I don't know. And instead, ask better questions. Ask open-ended questions and put your brain to work. How could I create more money, more abundance in my life? Your brain loves to go to work for you, so put it to work on something that serves you, that opens you up to more abundance rather than closing you off. Those are my hacks for expanding your money tolerance and creating a money mindset that really will serve you in your business. Oh, so good. I really wanted to get these thoughts out and I, I know I did it in just the right way that's going to speak to so many of you. I would love to hear about your generosity challenge or your thoughts on all of all things money. Join us in the private Facebook group and keep the conversation going over there. And if you have a minute, please just take a moment to rate and review this podcast. It's so, so helpful. And I would love to read your review uh, on the podcast in a future episode or you can go to the Food Business Success Facebook page and leave a review there. We are going to keep this conversation about money going for the next few weeks. I have some amazing guests coming up and we're gonna get into more of the practical things that you need to be doing in your business around finances and money. So definitely some great episodes coming up. And until then, have an amazing week.